Okay, well, welcome everyone to our, this is our combined outdoor rec and rural and small communities gathering. And uh, I'm Judy O'Leary, I'm a network coordinator with Climate Caucus, and I'm calling in from the traditional and unceded territories of the Sinaiic, Silks and Tanaha people in interior BC, also known as Nelson. And I'm really happy to have Carla Bitz here from the town of Banff who's going to be presenting today and we'll have time for a question and answer afterwards and at the very end I'll give you a little update on a couple of upcoming things that we have going on in Climate Caucus. So Carla is the environmental coordinator for the town of Banff, Alberta. She coordinates Banff's zero waste and circular economy initiatives which support the town's goal She's an ambitious goal to divert 70% of waste by 2028 and ultimately send zero waste to the landfill. As a municipality that, as many of you probably know, is uniquely situated within a national park and a UNESCO World Heritage Site, Banff faces unique challenges and opportunities in striving to become a model environmental community. But we've heard from Banff before and they're doing some great things. I'm looking forward to this. And Carla is an amateur gardener, food enthusiast, and policy nerd. And we like policy nerds at Climate Caucus. <laughs> she grew up in Calgary, so she's always had the privilege of enjoying Banff as her backyard and outdoor playground. So has a deep connection to the mountains. And that drives her work in ensuring the pristine beauty of Banff is enjoyed for generations to come. So I'm going to turn it over to Carla to share her screen and do her presentation and then we'll have some questions and answers. But it's a small group, so I assume if you have a burning question in the middle, just wave madly or put your hand up and we could do that. Okay, over to you, Carla. Yeah, absolutely. Feel free to jump in throughout. Um, thanks so much, Judy, for the nice introduction and thanks uh, to everyone for having me on your call. Um, I'm going to attempt to share what I've learned, I guess, about uh, circular economy and how it can apply in a municipal context. Um, it can be a really big topic and at times even a little bit nebulous, so uh, hoping to be able to share a couple of tangible examples of how we've made it work to some degree in, in BAMP. So my presentation will focus on a few things. Firstly, where BAMP started with circular economy and kind of how we got on this journey. Um, and then secondly, I'll speak to a, a tangible project that we've uh, implemented and that's come out of our circular economy strategy. And then thirdly, where we're going next with respect to a strategic framework and embedding circular economy into our other future actions. Um, also, by yeah, and again, yeah, I'm happy it's a small group. I'm by no means an expert on this topic. So I'm sure there's a lot of knowledge in the room and would be uh, super curious to hear from other people afterward and, and learn from others on this call. Um, so before getting into it, I'll just share my screen here. And yeah, but before um, everyone else got on the call, Judy and I were just uh, connecting and um, my computer crashed. So I had like a full on shutdown. So I, I hope that doesn't happen again in the middle of this, but if it does, I'll try to call in. Um, so does everybody see the picture of Banff on my screen here? Okay, perfect, and you can hear me okay? Great. Um, so, before getting started uh, on the circular economy topic and um, our journey with that, I just want to acknowledge in the spirit of truth and reconciliation that I'm presenting to you today from Minigay, or what is more commonly known as Banff, which is located on Treaty 7 territory or the traditional territory of the Yarhe Nakoda Nations, the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Sistina Nation, <clears throat> and many others who called Minike or Banff home long before a settler folk like myself. Um, and forgive me if I got any pronunciation wrong there. I'm trying to learn some of the traditional names in, in Banff as I think is a really important part of this work that we're all doing around climate and environment um, is acknowledging our indigenous peoples and that finding it really hard to find um, information on those names. So I'm not totally sure if I'm getting um, them all right yet, but trying. Um, so actually, I'm curious to know, maybe maybe people can put it in the chat as to where other people on the call are calling in from today. I see Gibson, Squamish, I know Judy's and Nelson. Um, so it sounds like we're all in, in similar boats of being in uh, communities where uh, we live close to nature and get to enjoy these beautiful outdoor spaces. Um, I'm not sure 
who has been to Banff before, but um, if you haven't, we're a small town in the Rocky Mountains of Alberta. We're either a small town of 10,000 people or a big city of 4 million, depending on whether or not you include our visitor base. I like to think we're kind of a small town trapped inside of a, or sorry, a big city trapped inside of a small town, uh, which really does present some pretty unique challenges and opportunities when it comes to sustainability. Um, so the photo on the screen here is a photo from uh, just outside my backyard. And again, for me, that's what really drives the importance of this work around uh, climate action. And, and I, I really see circular economy as part of our work on climate action. Um, and that, that for us is, is the big why. So I imagine uh, share, sharing that why probably with lots of others uh, folks on the call today. Um, so I'm not super sure uh, the level um, of knowledge on circular economy among people in, in the call. So I'll just provide a really quick uh, definition of what that means from, from our perspective, just to ensure everyone's on the same page. Um, but I, I'm sure people are probably somewhat familiar with the idea of circular economy. Um, so I think the best way that, and what, what circular economy means to me, I guess, is that uh, currently we live in this paradigm where we've accepted that we um, take, make, and waste products and resources. And that is very much a linear economy. Um, and what we've done, I think, since, since creating this linear economy, which is obviously problematic for quite a few reasons, um, is then move toward more of a recycling economy where best case scenario, we probably better called a downcycling uh, economy where we do our best to reuse and repurpose some of the resources that we produce, but ultimately they still, uh, still do, many of them still do end up uh, buried and going to waste and obviously there's a lot of resources requ required in the recycling process itself uh, and then and then what we're hoping to move toward and I think the new paradigm that people can get pretty excited about is this idea of a circular economy where we keep resources in circulation and even better best case scenario we just design our systems uh, for zero waste in the first place and do our best to prevent waste coming in to our communities um, through better design practices, ultimately. Um, and that, that's sort of what circular economy in a nutshell means to me. But like I said, um, it can be a bit of a nebulous topic and, and there's a lot of different ways we can look at it. Um, but I thought I'd just provide that as sort of a, a brief definition. Um, <clears throat> And yeah, like Judy mentioned, feel free to jump in with questions at any point in time or, or comments or if, if, if anyone has anything to add to that. Um, but I'll just start by getting into a Banff circular economy journey, which really began back in 2018 when our council uh, adopted waste diversion targets and goals. Um, at that time, we set the target to divert 70% of waste from landfill by 2028 and ultimately send zero waste to landfill by 2050, which is sort of our more aspirational goal, depending on who you ask, people seem to either think it's completely unrealistic or way too far away. So I actually don't really like the whole 2050 uh, piece of it too much anymore. Uh, so we just really say that we're, we're striving to move toward zero landfill waste on an aspirational level. Um, and what we knew uh, coming into this, and I, I started this role back in 2019, I really knew that yes, waste diversion is a super important part of the picture. We had a really long way to go on that journey. Our baseline diversion rate was somewhere in the 30 to 35 percent range, and we still have a long way to go. We're getting close to around 46, 47 percent now. Um, <clears throat> still quite a long ways to go to that 70 percent marker. But while we're working on waste diversion, we really also need to focus on looking at how we can move up that waste hierarchy and think back to those circular economy principles to stop waste from happening in the first place and design it out of our systems wherever possible um, on that reduction side of things. So uh, really looking at how can we go beyond waste diversion, which I think so many communities uh, around Canada and the world are now doing. Of course, in Europe, this was all done 
15 years ago when they figured out the circular economy <laughs> long before us. Uh, so we have lots of good examples to, to look at. Um, <clears throat> so um, as far as our damp circular economy goes, uh, like I said, we adopted the waste diversion goals and then it was it was early 2020. And I don't know if people in the call are familiar with the Recycling Council of Alberta, but they're sort of our provincial uh, organization that originally was designed to work on recycling uh, and then has moved beyond that to now look more at circular economy and upstream waste prevention. So it was early 2020, the Recycling Council of Alberta was launching a program that they called Circular Cities Alberta. And for us, that was the per perfect opportunity to jump on board and make sure that we had that circular economy lens embedded in everything we were doing around waste. So we got involved in that project um, and we were really lucky that a couple of things happened right before the world shut down. So we had a session in January of 2020 with uh, internal stakeholders from the municipality, from different departments, getting together, um, and that was facilitated by the Recycling Council of Alberta. And we brought together different ideas on what does circular economy mean to you and how can we approach it from different angles. So whether we're looking at it from the sustainability, climate action, zero waste angle, or access affordability, or is it more about economic prosperity? So we, we sort of had those conversations and that resulted in sort of the second icon from the left that you can see on the slide, which was a roadmap for, for the town and some initial ideas. This was very high level for how we could look at circular economy. Um, the, and I'll, I'll kind of come back to the other parts of this journey throughout the presentation. Um, but the other thing that we were really lucky happened right before uh, 2020 was uh, we launched a program called the Zero Waste Trail Program for the community. And one of the best parts of that program, or I guess one, one of the parts of the program that has uh, been, I think something our community has been quite proud of is our business trailblazers. So we we uh, created a program that acknowledges and recognizes business leaders that go above and beyond to move towards your waste. And so these business leaders in particular are doing more than just simple waste separation. They're, they're incorporating that circular economy lens and looking upstream at how to prevent waste in their businesses. So we launched that program, I think first week of March, 2020, got all of these lovely, inspiring business leaders in the room nice and close together. And then that was when, when COVID hit. And as I'm sure was the case in many other municipalities, municipalities that folks uh, here are part of our plans and priorities shifted dramatically. And I have to say it was really hard to keep uh, zero waste or the idea of circular economy uh, on the radar at all because we went into like emergency management mode. <clears throat> so, but we were lucky to get a couple of really great program launches in right before then. Um, so as the world, like as things were closing and our plans and priorities were shifting, one of the things in our community that stayed open was our waste transfer site. <laughs> and the photo here is of our reuse it center, which is this, tiny little shelter at the at Banff's waste transfer site, which is essentially a, a take it or leave it model for our residents. And it was started by the gentleman on the left here, Kenner, who has sadly since passed away, but he was our manager of resource recovery at the time and a really strong believer, I think without using the language of circular economy was very much a believer in circular economy and reuse and wanted to make sure that that was part of our material drop-off yard. And, and the most important pile in the material drop-off yard actually was the one where everything was being reused. So he's uh, very simply set aside this space in our yard for reuse it, which is loved uh, dearly by our residents in Banff. <laughs> so the funny thing was um, during the COVID times when everything was shut down with the waste transfer site open, all of a sudden the entire community was coming to the reuse it center, which very quickly became a public health hazard. And then the reuse it center also shut down. Um, so then which people were quite upset about. Uh, it was an outdoor space. We were, 
at that time, obviously, people weren't really sure what we could and couldn't do with respect to COVID, but we had to close the Reason Center temporarily because it started to become a, a gathering space in our community in the middle of COVID. Um, so, uh, and at that same time, we also found out that our Reason Center, um, while it was closed, would be physically moving to a different place in the yard. So with all of that, uh, myself and some of our staff in community development were actually tasked with coming up with a vision for what to do when the reuse at center would open again. Uh, we'd always talked about having like a longer term, bigger picture vision for the reuse at center, and this started to feel like the perfect time to have that conversation. <clears throat> um, so with that, we were able to, this was the new space uh, as the Reason Center was being built, we were able to launch a, an engagement and consultation process that went beyond the take it or leave it reuse it, reuse it model to examine different sharing opportunities in our community because we were continually hearing that that was something that people were interested in. Um, so as I'm sure it might be similar in other communities, we have uh, many residents in Banff who come to Banff for a few months or for a season, they need all the things you need to live a life, and then they need to get rid of those things at the end of their time here, um, which is a, a really perfect opportunity for sharing and lending that had also been identified through our circular economy road mapping process that we had done earlier that year. Um, and in that engagement process, we had just about 245 people complete our survey, which was a lot for our small community where people are over surveyed and uh, kind of done with online surveys. So we thought that was a pretty good response. Uh, and it showed really, really strong support for the idea of improving lending or sharing services. Um, and what was really neat that came through from that survey was not just that people were interested, and actually I would say predominantly people weren't necessarily uh, in it for the idea of waste reduction or um, sustainability. It was more coming from the lens of um, access and affordability to uh, things to do in the community, to goods that people need. And another one that I thought might be really interesting to note for people on this call um, was what we heard was that there is this huge need for non-physical recreation opportunities in, in Banff in this community where we have uh, such a, like the majority of people spend their winters skiing and their summers hiking. But we also heard that there's a, a strong group of people that want things to do that don't involve uh, physical recreation or going outside all the time. So that was, that was a really neat theme that came through in, in a community like ours where it would be maybe a little bit less expected. Um, so, all of that and some really good timing led to us being able to launch the Library of Things project. And this is not by any means a, a new concept. I'm sure there's so many communities around the world and so many libraries that have libraries of things embedded in their existing programming. So we had lots of great templates to work with. We didn't have to reinvent any wheels here, um, but I think, Ours has gone really well. I was actually just saying to a coworker when I'm having um, hard work days, I just walk over to the library of things because it's been one of those projects that's been knock on wood, just full sunshine and rainbows. And that's not the case with like most, most projects we work on. They're often quite challenging. And this one has just been a real joy to work on um, from both the lens of sustainability and the, and the lens of community building and access and affordability. Um, and I, I think there's three main things that were so critical in making Banff's Library of Things a success. Um, first off, we heard loud and clear from the community that this was a need and we responded to it and the community recognized that. And I think that means a lot in a small community, especially one where we have such a high visitor base and decisions aren't always made um, with residents at the forefront. Um, Secondly, uh, the partnerships were, I, I know we hear all the time, like collaboration, collaborate, collaboration, collaboration. In this case, uh, this was personally the best uh, experience in collaboration that I've ever had on a working project, um, both the internal collaboration. So our team 
I work with the environment and sustainability team and also very closely with our solid waste or resource recovery teams. So that part was a really close collaboration. And then again, as I mentioned, we worked really closely with our uh, staff in community development to make sure that access and affordability lens was incorporated in this project. And that had huge, huge advantages. And then secondly, the external partnership, which I haven't mentioned as much yet, was with our public library, who was so excited to get uh, a library of things going and did so much of the heavy lifting and like work to get it off the ground. Um, and then finally, timing wise, it was COVID, we were rethinking things, and then we had this opportunity to work with the Circular Communities Project with the Recycling Council of Alberta. Um, and we were able to obtain funding and start up funding through, through that program as well. So that really helped us very well. Um, so right now, the our Library of Things is just about exactly one year old. So we're kind of celebrating its birthday at the moment um, of the program being in place for just over a year following the initial pilot. We've had over 300 unique users, over a thousand item circulations, and just this really ongoing sense of positive feedback for the program. Um, and I'll share a little bit about what we uh, what we loaned through the Library of Things. Um, we, we decided, again, early on, partially due to that feedback, that we didn't want this just to be uh, necessarily just about tools. We wanted other types of hobby and non-physical recreation equipment. So we have five main categories of item lending, uh, cooking, home, hobbies, tools, and digital. Um, so I can personally attest to the, the waffle maker being a fantastic item. I, I live right across the street from the library of things, so I borrow that one pretty regularly. Um, our air fryer is pretty popular, and we also have a, a dehydrator and a couple of items that help our residents or could help our residents to look at food waste prevention. So again, we're also trying where we can to incorporate the, the zero waste lens for other issues within the library of things. Um, in the home category, we have the ever popular carpet cleaner. We've got an iron and a steamer. We've got extension cords. Um, and for hobbies, what's quite unique, we've got crochet hooks, sewing machines, wood carving sets, ukuleles, you name it and then kind of all the usual suspects with tools. Um, in the digital section, that has also been quite popular. We do have a couple of Wi-Fi smart hubs and a projector, those have been really popular items as well. But these are our top three lending items and I think they tend to say something about the community, in particular, the carpet cleaner. We have a lot of people who move in and move out of homes in Banff on a, on a monthly basis. And that thing, we've actually had to buy um, at least, I think, two more because it's permanently loaned out. Like it's, it's almost never available. <laughs> um, so it's quite, it's quite interesting to see um, how the popularity in certain items speaks to the characteristics of our community. And another thing we did, and I think this, this really aligns kind of nicely with the con concept of circular economy, is highlight the opportunity for experiences over purchases. So uh, the library did a really fantastic job of marketing some of the items as experience bundles and throwing in some giveaways, such as ingredients to make homemade pasta um, or um, supplies to make different crafts. Um, so that's that's one way we kind of launched and promoted it from the um, earlier on in the process. And now what we're really excited about, and this is something I've been hoping to do for quite some time, so it's just really great that the library has kind of taken on ownership of some of these programs and we're offering kind of funding support and collaboration with them is workshops. So we're, we've got a repair cafe style series going on uh, with some popular items. The, the sewing machine has been one of those items. So we've held a couple workshops on that and they have built up immediately. Another one coming up is our, the tool time series on automotive tools. So how to fix your car. Um, <clears throat> and going forward again, really looking at, yeah, just what makes sense in our community. So we know people use a lot of gear for their outdoor activities. So looking at something like a gear repair workshop and the plan is to have uh, a workshop a month 
for uh, the foreseeable future. And that's again being something something that's being funding funded through our circular economy uh, grant with the recipient of Alberta. Um, we've had a, like a lot of positive news on the library of things. And again, we keep kind of asking, like we think it's a bit interesting because these programs exist in a lot of other places. So we haven't necessarily done anything different. Um, Sarah, that's Sarah, our librarian, who's done a huge part of the heavy lifting on this project. And she would say, which I think maybe is of interest in the context of this call, that the connection with circular economy and messaging around your waste as a part of this programming has been one of the reasons that she has um, seen a lot of attention coming toward it and more so, more so maybe than another regular lending library. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that's true. That's just our speculation. Um, and, and that's something that she has seen as being quite unique. Um, so I'll just, actually, I think, I don't know, um, Judy, like how we're doing for time. I've just got a couple more slides after this three minute video. I don't know if we want to see it or if I can just do the next few slides and then wrap up. Oh, we have time. Keep Go for it, Carla. Okay. I don't know. Do people want to see the video? I don't. Okay. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Okay. Well, well, we'll see if it works. Libraries around the world have created libraries of things for many years. Um, we at the Banff Public Library have wished to for a long time, but we lacked the required infrastructure and capacity to do so. We managed in some small ways with kits, some sports equipment, a couple of tools, but it didn't go very far. The town of Banff completed a survey of the community asking what they wanted to do about items like this. And they found that this would be a very welcome asset to um, the community of Banff. So then we were able to act in partnership, Town of Banff Resource Recovery, Town of Banff Community Services, and the Public Library to create this program to allow for some item lending um, in our community. My name is Sarah McCormack and I am the Library Director at the Banff Public Library here in Banff, Alberta. Since the beginning of this project, we've had a joint partnership to make sure that it is um, as successful as possible. We worked closely with Town of Banff Community Services, Resource Recovery and Zero Waste from the Town of Banff, and we also worked with granting organizations such as the Recycling Council of Alberta and the Healthy Communities Digital In Initiatives Program. The pilot phase of this program began in October 2021. We had such fantastic feedback from our community that to move from the pilot to a permanent status was a really easy decision. The objects in the Library of Things are many and varied. They include power tools, cooking appliances, digital gadgets, internet hubs, games, and hobby items, such as sewing machines and wood carving tools. There's over 200 items that you can choose from at this time, and the collection continues to grow. In order to borrow items from the Library of Things, patrons will come into the library and make a Banff Public Library card. The town of Banff is a highly transient community, with people coming and going all the time. We also have very significant space constraints because we are limited living in a national park that way. So we find that some of these items are things that people just couldn't store in their home or they wouldn't want to buy for a short period of time. And we're saving the environment in a way as well because what we're doing here is really emphasizing the circular economy that the, the library has always done. Um, we've also had a lot of positive feedback from the province. We've won so far three awards. We're all really looking forward to see how this program is developing and changing as time progresses. Just like the rest of our collections, we're working through a system of determining which ones are popular in the community, which ones we keep, which ones we don't, and really gathering that community feedback to make sure that what we do is exactly what they're asking for. We're also working to integrate workshops and programs around the concept of circular economy and the library of things to both increase their use and allow better access uh, for our community members. Um, great. And I have to say, um, that video was made by our summer student on his iPhone. So credit to him. I don't know how people do that. Um, yeah. So that, like I said, our library of things has been our warm, fuzzy hug circular economy project. And it's, it's well loved by our community, but it's, it's just one thing we've done that's, that's tangible, um, in that respect. Um, 
And I'll just wrap up with a couple more points of kind of where we're planning to go from here with, with the circular economy journey. Uh, the, this slide is of an asset map that we recently created to showcase different circular economy assets or assets in our community that could be related to the circular economy, really focusing on the three words at the top there, share, repair, and reuse. This is something that we, we actually just had developed with our in collaboration with our GIS department to get a map online that we can continually build on. And we're really hoping to work more closely with, in particular, um, our more transient communities and in particular uh, large employer staff accommodations to promote these services uh, as an alternative to ownership and buying new and then having to get rid of things. Like I said, when people uh, move and move in and out of our community. Um, Finally, sorry, this looks like a really convoluted Excel sheet and it actually is. Um, I guess what I just want to highlight next is we're in the process of updating the town's zero, uh, action plan with respect to zero waste. So as I mentioned, in 2018, we started with some waste diversion targets. Um, and then since we've, we've embedded this circular economy lens and now we're gonna be bringing that all together, acknowledging the ways in which our community has changed throughout the pandemic and creating an updated set of actions to hold us accountable to those upper layers of the waste hierarchy, as well as the ongoing work we need to continue doing around waste diversion as well. Um, so we're working on that right now. Uh, we had another intern working with us on circular economy over the last few months who also completed this heat map to look at different materials moving through our community and then the different layers of the waste hierarchy. So refuse, reduce, rethink, reuse, and repair and where we had strengths and weaknesses with all of those different materials. And so that, that asset map that I just showed actually came out of this heat map analysis as well. So we'll be using this to inform uh, future actions in our zero waste action plan, which we'll be working on early next year. And then um, we just, we also are working on an updated waste characterization study. And I don't know if anyone recognizes the vegetables in that photo. Anyone? It was a garlic scape, which made me particularly sad because I don't know if anyone's had garlic scapes. They're just the most delicious vegetable and you only get them at this that really special time at the beginning of the harvest season. And uh, yeah, we recently, so we recently did a, a waste characterization study and found lots of things in our garbage stream. I was lucky enough to have the chance to uh, literally dig in and participate. And so we're, we're, we're using that waste characterization study, not just to identify diversion opportunities, but reduction, uh, waste reduction and circular economy opportunities as well. So we've actually categorized our sort um, our sort of categories in a way that reflects the reduction opportunities. So some of the data we were seeing uh, really shows a few key themes that compostables are still a really large part of our waste streams uh, in both commercial and residential. But for example, we also categorize different types of single use items to look at where we can just reduce and stop waste from happening, happening in the first place and not just um, focus on composting or recycling it. Um, uh, the last thing I was just going to highlight is if, uh, again, not knowing exactly where folks are at on the call with their own circular economy journeys, but there's a couple things that might be of interest as far as learning more or getting involved that um, I'm aware of. Um, the Circular Cities and Regions Initiative is basically the circular communities initiative that I mentioned that was happening for Alberta gone Canada wide. And so that's been happening over the last couple of years. I don't know if anyone here is in, involved in it, um, but there's a, a really strong growing network of cities across Canada that are implementing circular economy roadmaps and strategies through this program and through the support of this program. And it's been really, really neat to see the ways in which that network is growing and circular economy has all of a sudden gone from this uh, idea and something that people are talking about to something that's really being integrated across municipalities in Canada. 
uh, next week or the week after, I think there's the World Circular Economy Forum, and that's actually a free online event that anybody can join and tap into. I think the in-person event is happening in Rwanda, uh, but again, you can plug in from anywhere around the world online. And then next week, this is a little bit of a different angle and I think more so focused on uh, single use item reduction and reuse, but there's a conference happening next week in Toronto as well um, that I've been involved with. And there's an online live stream for that event too. And the whole day is about reuse and sharing refilling, conserving of resources, and that's a free online event as well. Lots of connections to the circular economy with that. And then, yeah, just the last page is, is uh, to say thank you to all of you for listening. I feel like I've talked for a really long time, so I'm curious to hear from other people on the call. Um, and just a quick thank you to the the folks who funded our projects. We had a lot of support from the Recycling Council of Alberta, as well as uh, colleges and institutes of Canada who provided an intern for this project as well. And um, ongoing, like I mentioned, cannot say over and over enough that it was actually our public library team who's probably done the most work in this whole project and we've just kind of helped to, uh, to get it off the ground. So thank you, that's all I've got. Thanks so much, Carla. That was really interesting. I'll get you to end your screen share. There we go. Yeah, so many surprising things in there. I'm so impressed at, at how much a small community is doing. Um, so I'll open it up to questions and you can wave your hand at me or use the hand signal. Jim. Hi, um, I'm interested to know more about the um, Trailblazer um, program that you ran. Would you be willing to maybe, um, if I put my details in the chat, share some more information about that? Um, I asked because we're developing our own um, circular economy roadmap. I work in economic development. It seems like some good alignment there. Community kind of um, stakeholder engagement consultations being one area that I've been struggling with a bit. So I think this might be a really good program for us to look into in terms of identifying leaders in the space. So um, if you'd be willing to share, that'd be amazing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, Jen. And um, I mean, I see you're from Squamish, so it's probably I know somewhat comparable thinking. context. Mm -hmm. um, and the, I, the one thing I can say, I know I've just blazed over that program, but it's been quite simple. And also, um, yeah, another one where in the, in the small community context, the positive peer pressure worked better than I thought. Because when we were in the process of <laughs> developing the like award and the recognition, we thought, okay, does anyone really kind of care about this dorky zero waste award? And it was, it was really neat because, um, that when we launched the initial uh, first round, we had a couple of businesses call us right away being like, how come I didn't get that award? Like I'm doing all those things too. And we, I was super shocked because I honestly just didn't think anyone would care about it. So it's, it's been really neat. It's like, it's a little source of positive peer pressure in, in our community where the word spreads fast. So yeah, I can, all of the information is on our website, but if you have any more questions, I can. Happy okay, I'll have a look at the website. Thank you. And then the other piece that I wanted to ask, oh, I don't know if anyone else has got a question. I should let someone else. Oh, go ahead, Jen. Okay, so the other piece that I wanted to ask about with that internal stakeholder engagement piece, we are participating in the CCRI. Was that how you manage that, that um, internal stakeholder engagement or was it prior to your involvement? So yeah, it was like the, the Recycling Circular. Council of Alberta did their circular communities program prior to the launch of the CCRI. Okay. Um, they sound really similar. They basically are sort of the same, but one was on a provincial level and then now the yeah. CCRI is national. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I think the CCRI is much more developed than the what RCA was doing at that time. So yeah, our initial engagement was through the RCA and the provincial circular communities program. Yeah. Um, but I think from what I understand, like it looks quite similar to what communities in the CCRI are doing. But now. that was how you that was how you kind of got your internal stakeholders engaged was through that program. Yeah. Is that right? Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. 
great, good questions. Rob, you had a question? Yes, I do. Uh, I'm in Paul River on the coast. Uh, thank you very much, Carla. Uh, great, uh, ex exciting news you have. Just uh, wonder if you have any comments about uh, plans for your community uh, in trying to get uh, uh, organics out of your uh, solid waste stream. We, I'm just thinking about some of the blocks that we've run into, and I wonder if you've got any inspiration for me. Thanks. No, well, I mean it's challenging, but I think like we we do have. Um, in, in mainly in the commercial sector, like we do have a really active organics diversion program. We actually just implemented a material ban on organics to landfill. So it's, it's actually mandatory for businesses to separate. Um, and so at the time of that waste characterization study, it wasn't mandatory quite yet. Uh, so I expect we're, we're actually doing round two of our waste characterization this week. So I expect we might see slightly different results i think it's improving and we are seeing our tonnages go up but oh my gosh it's such an ongoing like especially in banff and i know i've maybe sound like a broken record but we have so many people coming in and out of our community so regularly that we can't just educate everyone once and expect it to work it's it doesn't it's just ongoing ongoing education and communication and that for us was what presented a need for a bylaw. So we now have a bylaw in place, which makes it mandatory for commercial. Um, and then in residential, we, I don't know if anyone else has the same system, uh, but we have the communal bear proof bins around town. So what we've been doing is adding the organic stream to most of our stations around town that had garbage. So our, our goal is that every station would have garbage recycling and organics and we're getting closer to that so we're trying to make it more convenient and all of that with ongoing education that the amount of education we've done doesn't feel proportionate to the results we're seeing so uh, it's hard yeah I don't know yeah I, lot, lots of ideas but uh, I feel like yeah we have a long way to go but thank you that's yeah. too new for me <laughs> <laughs> policy make, make, <laughs> yeah make it uh, mandatory mm -hmm. great yeah thank thanks. you thanks carla uh david and then ralph thank you um just with respect to the organic recycling um in gibson's we i don't have the figures for 2022 yet but for in 2021 we diverted uh, about 2255 tons of organic waste from the landfill um, which is fairly positive. Um, unlike BAMP, we started with residential first and now we're bringing commercial online. Um, but we, we don't have sort of at the public um, waste bins of the opportunity for people to separate into um, organic. The other thing we do have here in Gibsons is a very um, active recycle depot. Um, the regional district and the district of Seashalt are looking, uh, they've been doing curbside recycling, but um, speaking to the people at the actual depots, they found a lot of the stuff ends up being um, sort of cross-contaminated and ends up at the landfill. So the Gibson's model seems to be working. Um, there was a reuse it store, um, at the depot, but uh, unfortunately with COVID, it did close. Uh, there was a huge book recycling uh, facility, which again with COVID, it has just reopened. Um, but it it's, um, you know, it's there are some interesting challenges, um, wildlife particularly. In the town of Gibsons, we have a fairly small um, recycle bucket, which gets picked up weekly. In the regional district, they went to a larger one and it's become a major sort of attractant to to um, wildlife. It's it's too large, unless you have a really well fortified garage, you don't, it's awkward to keep it. But um, we're really quite proud of what we've been doing. But we've also got our eyes on Nelson because they, they're they going with the countertop composters and with the increased costs of collection, um, we're starting to see how things go in Nelson. 
Thanks, David. Did you have any comments on that, Carla? No, I'm just curious to learn more from you. But yeah, I'm also curious about Nelson's model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I'm there. We're going to be, there's going to be a pilot this year on it. And part of their thinking was that the carbon footprint of trucking all of this material to the regional depot was a lot. So we'll see how it works. I'm going to try one out myself. So that it goes. Um, um, just if I can jump in, uh, Buddy Boyd, who originally used to run the Recycle Depot here in Gibsons, who is the guru of zero waste, um, lives in, he's got a tiny home, drives an EV, um, and I think he, it was Buddy who actually introduced the composters that um, Nelson are considering using. Um, I've been sort of toying with trying it out on the home front. The only downside I can see are the cartridges that you have to continually have to replace in them. Um, oh, we'll check all that out, David. Um, I can go to Ralph now if it. I could, David, just to get Ralph's question in. Yep. Thank you. Just very quickly, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, your sister community just north of you from Jasper here, um, we seem to parallel a lot of things we do together, um, but not really together. We're, we're paralleling each other. Um, you know, we do have the recycling for cardboard. We do have our composting in both business and and uh, in the residential areas. One of the things we find with composting is uh, the volume. We actually are having trouble dealing with the volume and then able to get the quality compost after uh, needing to introduce other things into the organics to make sure that you get a quality compost. But one of our bigger concerns, and, and this will parallel Banff completely, we're home to here four and a half thousand people, Banff seven and a half thousand people. We welcome 20,000, 30,000 people more a day. The amount of cardboard that comes into our communities they have to deal with. And there's no real market for cardboard anymore. And it's really challenging to do the circular economy. And that, that's probably one of the biggest challenges we're having right now. I just want to see if there's any um, insight currently in Banff. I'll be watching your, your waste strategy over the next while. Um, because right now we're finding it's costing us more to deal with cardboard in a responsible manner than what we can glean uh, in the open market. Carla, did you have thoughts yeah. on that? Yeah, my understanding, like I don't deal too much with our materials processing directly, but my understanding is we are getting good uh, value for our cardboard right now. So we um, could connect you with our manager of resource recovery or I could find out more information there. But yeah, you're so right. And like, I think about that with pallets too, even for example, like how through like for our service industries and how much is coming in and out of the community when could it not be, and, and then disposed of and downcycled rather than reused. Like, it, yeah, I'm interested in, in what the reuse systems could look like for those on more of a circular economy ones. That's yeah. challenging. Um, Laura, then Alex. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. I, I'm curious to know if you have some sort of ballpark figures on your organics volume and then what you're actually doing to process that. You know, is it outdoor windrow composting? Is it uh, anaerobic chamber stuff? Um, and again, also ballpark figure for cost. Mm. Yeah, it's about a thousand. Like right now, we're at somewhere just over a thousand tons a year for um, food waste diversion, and then it's going to a farm in central Alberta for windrow composting, and it's expensive. <laughs> um, and I know, like um, we, uh, Banff has a really affordable situation with our landfill garbage, and so it actually it's really a really interesting conversation. Like even at our council level, which is our garbage is really cheap, which makes organics look, look even more expensive. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, it's it is more expensive for us to manage that material than it is uh, the other streams, and it's tricky, like other people have said. So always looking for better ways to do it. That is it. 
yeah, so far, um, sending it for wind or composting has been the solution we've continued to come back to, even though we've evaluated other solutions like AD or um, ways that we could uh, at least process some of it on, on site. And we haven't been super successful in those. So we're continuing to track it. It's not ideal. No, thank you. Okay, and Alex? Thanks. Um, yeah, so I'm um, I'm I'm from Calgary, so I come to Banff all the time and was just there this weekend. Love it. Great job. Um, I was just going to ask you um, if you are currently or if you have any plans to do any more like regional based work with other municipalities, maybe like in the Bow Valley, um, like, I don't know, Canmore, Lake Louise or anything like that. Yeah, I see Caitlin's. I see Caitlin's name here. Caitlin's from Canmore. Um, yeah, we we talk with Canmore pretty regularly, and I think we could always be better at like actually collaborating. But um, for sure, yes, uh, we less so for for me with with Lake Louise. Um, but we do, for example, like the town manages some of the waste streams in Lake Louise, but they're they're very different because they fall under um, Parks Canada contracts and it's it's just it's a really kind of unique relationship but um yeah on the regional collaboration i would say probably canmore is the strongest and we're trying to do more together but and then yeah it's like it's nice to hear like ralph from jasper like it's so true i don't really actually connect too much regularly with folks in, in jasper so it'd be good to do that more often great and i see ramona put some information in the chat ramona did you want to speak to that at all uh, sure. I, I just got that um, last week from the executive director at um, CBEAN, which is um, Environmental Educators Organization. And um, uh, we in the rural areas around Nelson um, are not concrete in what we're doing yet um, either, uh, just because um, we would be further even from the composting facility. and. Um, and so um, I'm looking at the food cyclers as as, as well, uh, just out of pure interest uh, now as an unelected person. But while I was elected, I was looking at them with interest because we had um, we had some comments both ways from people who had used them. And uh, so the the thing that you want is if you purchase something for the community with grant funds or taxation, you want them to actually work. So uh, I think Nelson has been taking a, uh, a, a very measured approach um, and uh, I don't know what they found for the negative, but um, there are people who love them and then there's another conversation going on. So that's what I wanted to say. Thanks Ramona, that's really helpful. Any last questions? I'm going to, we'll be sharing the recording and the slides that I got from Carla in the newsletter. If you're not signed up for the newsletter, you can, uh, you can join on our website or you can just email me and I can do that for you. And I uh, also want to let you know that we have um, upcoming, uh, a couple of upcoming things to let you know. One is a webinar on community solar best practices for local governments. And we've got a, a couple of speakers for that. And I'll just, uh, I'll just put that in the chat here. If it's working. Yeah, there we go. So that's where you can register for that. We'll have a speaker from the Métis Crossing Solar Project in Smoky Lake, Alberta, the Environment and Climate Change Director there, and also someone from Halifax, their Community Energy Manager, talking about community renewables for solar. So that's coming up, and then you'll also see on our website, we're starting to advertise our summit, which is going to be in February, so please think about attending that. And uh, for this particular group, we're going to sort of revisit what kind of topics we should be having. I'll probably reach out to some of you to get some input on that. And then we will also be having an emissions modeling workshop, especially geared to outdoor rec communities, but to other small communities in January. So I'll keep you all in the loop in that. 
And thank you all for coming. And thank you so much for Carla for a great presentation. It was really interesting, especially finding out about that affordability and equity lens that came to the fore in the community. That was really interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Really nice to meet everyone. Yeah, see you all next time. Thanks, Carla. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.